Dr. Bevan, I was asking you about um, some observations in your witness statement, um, and I'm just yeah. going to pick up on that again. So, Shomit, could we have back on screen WITN 4106001, please, and go to page 23. So if we pick it up in the bottom half of the page, <coughs> um, you refer um, in, in the third paragraph of what's on screen to some factor eight companies pulling the wool over the eyes of medical opinion leaders, armor taking visiting UK <coughs> haemophilia doctors around their plasma collection facilities where fresh faced college students underwent plasma paresis to provide a relatively safe source of product. However, Armour didn't reveal to their visitors the massive supplementation by pools bought on the Canadian spot market. The eminent haemophilia doctor, Peter Jones, published a brave mea culpa, admitting to having been deceived in this way. Um, it, it, is that something of which you have personal knowledge or discussed with colleagues or, or, or Dr. Jones, or, or is that based upon what you'd read? It's based upon his, his article, which came out at the time. Um, I myself have visited the Armour... Uh, later the CSL bearing Revlon, I, I, I forget which phase of their get ownership it was, N their Knoxville University uh, Apheresis Centre, which is indeed reassuring, but I was e additionally reassured by the fact it was taking part after heat treatment had been introduced, and uh, they went into great detail about the complex donor surveillance, donor selection criteria they were now applying. So even though I saw the uh, fresh-faced college students giving plasma, they were actually also getting proper uh, antiviral uh, testing before giving plasma. In fact, that they had really what I would see as lock, rock-solid uh, process whereby um, their, their plasma is held and not used until they've passed several sequential um, safety tests. So I, I may have had the wool pulled over my eyes. It was still a company trip, but by then it, it had been rendered safe. And in fact, as you know, um, subsequent to that, uh, no, no infections have been transmitted through plasma-derived products, although we avoid them on, on principle now. So uh, my, my, I, I know that that was the policy of the companies. Um, I know they have relatively safe plasmapheresis uh, collection facilities, but unfortunately they were also supplementing it with plasma, the safety of which they had absolutely no control over. And for the sake of completeness, Dr. Bevan, what was the year of your visit? Oh, gosh, I can't remember. It was something like... 89, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and then picking up um, with uh, your observations in relation to hepatitis C, so the bottom two paragraphs, you said this, in the case of HCV by comparison with AIDS, there was ample warning. Every haemophilia treater in the US, the UK and elsewhere knew that their patients were acquiring an infection from factor VIII concentrate and that this infection was marked by a significant rise in liver transaminase enzymes i.e. it was a hepatitis likely to be a viral hepatitis. For circumstantial reasons, including a lack of symptoms during the acute phase, the absence of jaundice in cases of acute liver necrosis, the lack of a known pathogen and a blood test to demonstrate antibodies to it, the disease was widely considered to be non-serious. The progressive development of chronic hepatitis and cirrhosis remained silent because of the historic rule that liver biopsy and haemophilia was hazardous and absolutely contraindicated. In the absence of evidence from liver biopsies, the assumption was made that this viral hepatitis was an inconvenience but essentially harmless. And if we go over the page, please show me to the top of the next page. You say this, such an assumption is the kind that doctors should not make. The overt, potentially fatal, acute severity of hepatitis B was regarded as distinguishing between the two viral illnesses. Just, just a question there. Did you mean uh, 
the way it's come out on the typing is a distinguishing. Uh, do, did you mean a distinction? Uh, yes, a distinction or distinguishing without the A. Oh, yeah. Between the two viral illnesses, when attention should have been given to the likelihood that they were similar, I feel guilt on account of accepting this myth of harmlessness when it was first expounded to me, even though I was just a junior trainee with zero clout. Uh, accordingly, I think that those who formulated the advice promulgated by UKHCDO were late to recognize the reality of transfusion transmitted HIV infection, and so may have made a minor contribution to the scale of HIV infection in patients with bleeding disorders. The community of hemophilia specialists made a somewhat larger historical contribution again, much smaller than that of the companies, to the scale of the HCV infection, a much older disorder, by assuming that it was relatively, a re relatively harmless condition for much of the 1970s. However, it should be pointed out that throughout that time there were opponents of this view and that it was members of the same community, including Dr. Krask, Professor Eric Preston, Dr. Mike Macris, and Professor Christine Lee, and the same organization, UKHCDO, who thoroughly corrected this assumption during the 1980s. And Dr. Bevan, just going back to the paragraph at the top of that page, it is, I'm paraphrasing, but is this a right way to understand what you're saying there? That, in a sense, the wrong question was asked or considered in relation to hepatitis B and non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, the distinction between the two in the acute phase was somehow regarded as the key criterion rather than consideration of whether in the longer term the two illnesses or viruses might um, lead to similar consequences? Um, yes, I think probably that might have been clarified if after similar I'd added in the long term, because as we know, hepatitis B can also cause chronic hepatitis cirrhosis. Mm. Um, so I meant in the, in the long term that they'd be similar. And is, is there anything um, else by way of addition or... Or, or explanation that you have to add to the observations that you've set out there? No, except, I, uh, I don't, again, as I, hindsight bias is not in something any of us can avoid. In fact, it's like an inherent part of the human brain. But uh, I'm still rather amazed by the fact that that assumption that they were looking at a harmless phenomenon was was sustained. I, I, it just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Doctors are usually accused of um, over-exaggerating dangers rather than the reverse. I think that's probably our role. So, um, again, one must uh, avoid anachronism here in that uh, concepts like that of... Um, oh, sorry, I used, I used it later. The precautionary principle did not, to my knowledge, exist then, certainly not in medical practice or common parlance. The, the idea that you would actually take action in respect to perceived dangers, even if those perceived dangers were relatively remote or not defined. Um, so as, as I later dis discussed, the, the approach to VCJD, for example, from the outset has been based on the precautionary principle that no matter what inconvenience problems it may cause in everyday life. You have to proceed on the assumption that certain people are going to be transmitters of the disease. So, uh, but that concept of um, precautionary principle was certainly not, it may have been published by philosophers, but it had not yet appeared in medical practice, like many other subsequent in, uh, developments like the concept of clinical governance, etc. That's all. We, we can take the statement down. D D Dr. Bevan, I think amongst the materials that, that have been provided to you in advance of your evidence was a, a letter from Dr. Spence Galbraith, who was a public health doctor, epidemiologist, um, uh, who in May of 1983 was advising the DHSS precisely along precautionary lines, suggesting that there should be a suspension of the importation of US concentrates. We, we can look at the document if, if you want, but I, it has been provided to you. I hope you had the opportunity to look yeah, at no, it. Yeah, no, I recall it, yeah. Um, was that something which ever came to your attention at the time? No, not, not in 1983. Um, 
I'm going to move on now to deal with various uh, other topics touched on by your, your statement, um, Dr. Bevan. The first is in relation to the national tendering process that you describe in your statement as being implemented from 2005 onwards, um, which is, as you put it in your statement, eliminated directors from the direct purchasing of blood products. What were the advantages and, and any disadvantages of, of that system from your perspective? Um, from my perspective, there were no disadvantages of the introduction of centralized purchasing. It was all good. I mean, first of all, it, uh, it achieved, a, in world terms, quite unique reduction in, in, in costs, reduction of price per unit. Um, secondly, it, it lifted what I would call a ethical weight, moral weight, from the, the shoulders of haemophilia directors, who were no longer, uh, as obviously, the sole determinants of which products they they used. I mean, I was particularly glad that by the time I took over the directorship at Guy's and St. Thomas's, when the product budget was of the order of £25 million a year, that I no longer, if you like, had such very large amounts of money in my gift. Um, I'm sure I would have been, you know, the subject of a lot more attention if, I, if it had been. So I was, uh, it seemed to me that the, the mechanism for the national contract involved quite sufficient elements of a degree of choice uh, over which products you had and that you were able to communicate your your preferred product um, by then uh, I think most of us felt that the recombinant products introduced were completely identical in functional terms uh, whether they were you know, as you know, some of the recombinant products have got the B domain effect rate deleted, and some people thought that that was a risk of inhibited generation. Doesn't seem to be the case. So, basically, um, a certain degree where it was required, a certain degree of user choice was um, was incorporated within the national contract structure. So, uh, I think it was all it was a, a, an overall great benefit. And do you know of any reason why such a system, um, which would have meant individual directors were no longer having to take decisions that varied enormously from centre to centre and, and, and across the country, um, why such a system couldn't have been introduced earlier? <laughs> I mean, it was a, the organisation of the purchasers with relation to haemophilia services the funding of Factor Eight um, had previously been um, dispersed and chaotic between various health authorities. There was no, haemophilia was not on the specialist commissioning, I mean, again, commissioning as such. Um, haemophilia needed to be under the aegis of a specialized commissioning function before proper attention could be paid to the funding of the subject. Um, and there was no until the commissioning side of the subject was properly formulated, I, I don't see that they could have run a centralised purchasing. So, so it, it, it required other developments before it could be put effectively into use. Okay. And those other developments reflecting reorganisation of, of the way in which NHS bodies dealt with one another? Well, specifically the way in which they dealt with commissioning in haemophilia care uh, which became um, a separate uh, item on the specialised commissioning field. Um, moving from that then to, to uh, prior to 2005, um, when decisions were still either for individual directors or for regional consortia, um, we've provided you with a couple of examples of letters that were sent to you by Cutter um, I think you've described them in your statement as sales pitches, letters talking about the, the particular co treatment and, and, and a d discussion of price and the like. How common was it for you to receive approaches um, from pharmaceutical companies once you took over as director? And, and what form did those approaches customarily take? Um, I mean, that was... That was perhaps slightly unusual in that um, uh, 
I, I can't remember. I mean, I've, I explained that I can't remember that communic that uh, correspondence at all. Uh, it was at a time when you know I had um, quite wide responsibilities to a large number of patient groups and disease categories, and the, the thought of it was at the periphery of my knowledge. And I, I used to generally discount communications from drug reps. Now that that's all with all due respect because I've known some very very, you know, correct drug reps who, who know a lot about their subject. But um, I would normally consign such messages fairly rapidly to the kind of the round file, as it's constantly referred to. So I do not recall that interaction at all. In fact, what she appears to be offering me um, is to do with the technique of heat treatment of the product. So... Um, if you like, because there was some, at that time it was still uncertain, I think, which was the best heat treatment pro protocol for non-A, non-B non hepatitis, hep C, whereas it was quite clear that uh, the heat, all the heat treatment techniques got rid of the, H, the HIV virus. Um, there, there was a point to it, but I, if it, I, unfortunately I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't recognize it at the time and I didn't recall it. In terms of approaches, if you like, from competitors to the people who were supplying us, I would expect them at least once every six months from each each company. Uh, usually, as I say, not based on something specific like this, like which is the degree of heat treatment. Um, I think that's all I can say on that, since I, you know, my memory has failed me on that one. So, some um, uh, witnesses have described pharmaceutical companies providing some form of funding to centers, whether it be for training or education or um, uh, um, facilities and products. W w was the center at St. George's, to your knowledge, ever in receipt of funding along those lines from pharmaceutical companies or donations from pharmaceutical companies? No, direct donations to departments uh, as far as I'm concerned, never happened at St George's or, or indeed uh, at uh, Guy's and St Thomas's, um, because that would be a very crude and overt way of doing it. Um, the companies, of course, provided sponsorship for the attendance of medical staff, including the director, but often several members of the clinical staff, if you had them, to major international conferences, the sort of conference to which haemophilia directors really should be going, World Federation of Haemophilia, um, International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, sometimes American Society of Hem Hematology meetings, where there would be substantial uh, uh, sessions on haemophilia, on haemophilia, on, on blood transmitted infections. I mean, where you are likely to see state-of-the-art research discussed and also to, to be able to discuss with peers in other countries uh, various approaches. So I think it's doctors needed to go to those affairs. Um, they were extremely expensive to attend and register for. So simply getting a registration fee to uh, ASH or World Federation of Haemophilia would, would cost of the order of 600, 700 pounds. And then you'd have to, usually they were held in major centers where there was vast amounts of uh, hotel accommodation because these these conferences would often have 30 or 40,000 delegates from around the world and uh, that whole that was expensive and the travel was expensive because a lot of the conferences were in the US um, no way could any NHS clinician fund that out of any NHS funds they simply weren't available for such things and uh, very few had uh, private means sufficient to, uh, to do that, and so in a way, we all took we all took advantage of that system. Now it may be that um, the companies could have put people up at uh, motels and so on. Normally, they chose four star or even more star hotels. Uh, having said that, I did stay at a motel once at um, in Seattle. Uh, because there simply weren't enough major hotel beds in the center and somewhere down the list. So basically, yes, the companies provided that. And during attendance at such conference, the companies would often 
take you out for a meal. And usually these were quite expensive restaurants. So yes, to one's shame, one, one, one participated. Um, companies would sometimes provide, uh, with the World Federation of Haemophilia, uh, companies also provided support to, to patients and family members uh, and members of organizations like Haemophilia Society to, to attend those because the World Federation of Haemophilia is an open meeting for patients and their representatives as well as medics, uh, nurses, counselors, the whole gamut of the multidisciplinary team. Uh, and they supported those as well. When it came to patient organizations, I'm sure the companies uh, supported the Haemophilia Society. Uh, they tried to set up an organization which I don't think was ever particularly, uh, I say this with due respect, uh, took off, called the Haemophilia Alliance, which was on the basis of things like the renal. I think there's a renal alliance, which is partially funded by dialysis mach machine constructors and so on. So drug companies have often funded the setup of such organizations which involve patients and doctors, if you like, pressure groups for improved services. Um, uh, so those are, and the third thing is that companies at one stage, knowing that you needed to train uh, patients and their carers to self-inject, and knowing that some places didn't have haemophilia nurses to do this, offered um, uh, nurse specialists uh, that they would entirely fund to teach your patients how to administer the product. And that was pro proposed to me once at George's and uh, it was regarded as uh, internally uh, impossible or unwanted by the by what then what subsequently has become the trust then was just the hospital. So um, they did op offer that. They would provide um, refrigerators for people to keep their product in at home. They would provide carrier bags and uh, cold store equipment for patients who needed to keep it at home. Um, they would provide booklets and educational facilities for patients. Um, if you like, a range of activities which are, would seem to be completely blameless or to have no, no ulterior motive, really. The motive of the pharmaceutical company in, for example, funding the hotel and the meals and the transport and so on was presumably, at the very least in large measure, to influence the clinician to uh, uh, choose the products of that pharmaceutical company. Um, it, I, I've been thinking about this. Yes, it would. But at the same time, it was mostly after the fact. So, um, by and large, patients, <laughs> patients, directors, uh, and other staff were taken were 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 um, supported by companies they already had a relationship with. So it may well have been a quid pro quo, but it was after the event in most cases. I know of no one who's, um, if you like, there was a bidding war. No, I mean the company's motive is always profit, always. And um, what if any systems or processes were in place, whether within St George's or in the NHS more widely, to your knowledge, that might have protected against at least unconscious bias, subconscious bias, um, as a result of, of those kind of interactions and dealings? Yes, of course, and that's why it's um, it's much less. Uh, what's the right word? Much much less indulgent nowadays. I mean, various regulations have been put in place, sequential regulations by the ABPI and other international pharmacy governance agencies to steadily reduce the monetary value of any such support. Um, however, I believe the basic elements which are registration fees, hotel costs and travel costs are still being supported. Um, move to ask you uh, briefly about BCJD. You've touched upon the, the, the difference of approach as a matter of principle and the application of a more precautionary um, uh, approach. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about one document you referred to in your statement. Show me, could we have on screen, please, WITN 1194004, please?
if we go to the next page. Uh, so you'll see, Dr. Bevan, this is a letter um, from you and your paediatric colleague and the haemophilia nurse specialist, September 2004. Uh, and it says uh, this, you may have heard from the Haemophilia Society in newspapers or on television that some batches of clotting factors manufactured in the UK by BPL were made from pools that included plasma donated by individuals who later developed VCJD. These newly identified batches are in addition to some that were similarly affected a while ago. So far, only a few batches of clotting factor used between 94 and 97 are known to contain this material. However, new cases of VCJD in people who were once plasma donors might occur in the future. So all clotting factors made from UK pool plasma between 1980 to 2001 have now been reclassified as being at risk of transmitting VCJD. Because in the past you received some clotting factors made from pooled UK plasma donations, you may have an, you may have an additional risk of acquiring VCJD. The risk is called additional because anyone who ate UK beef products during those years is assumed to be at low degree of risk of developing VCJD. So any risk from UK plasma products is in addition, and then you refer to an information pack. After you've read the information, you'll need to decide whether you want to know if you received any batch of clotting factor known to contain plasma from individuals who later developed VCJD. The Haemophilia Centre staff will help in any way possible before or after your decision. Our preferred way would be to see you in person for confidential discussion of the issues involved. Um, now I'm not going to go through the details of all the kind of national notification processes, but... This was a process in which, as I understand your statement, Dr. Bevan, you and your colleagues decided to afford your patients the, uh, the, the right to say if they wanted to have this information or not. Is that correct? And can you just explain your thinking, please? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and I, I don't think we were unique in this at all. Um, okay, let me just get my head around this. The problem was that here we're dealing with something completely different from, v, uh, from HCV or HIV in that um, you're dealing with a huge area of uncertainty. So the uncertainty is expressed in the second paragraph in that we can't say which batches, that these are the only batches that are, have a risk in this, of this type. Um, since VCJD, VCJD has an incubation period of anything up to 40 years, I don't know what the current feeling is, then it was 20 to 30 years, now it's probably longer, um, basically any plasma product produced in the UK uh, might contain such stuff. And of course, any plasma donated in the UK was subsequently uh, excluded from any use in the manufacture of clotting factors. Um, so you're, you're immediately transmitting a, a feeling of uncertainty to patients. Have you been a, ex, a exposed or have you not? We can't say at this point. We have to cover all the bases. Secondly, we have no idea of the actual degree of this risk um, of actually getting clinical VCJD. Um, as it turns out, the risk seems to be vanishingly low because still no people with haemophilia in the UK have developed VCJD. Um, I know there was one that had uh, pathological prion and extracted from their spleen, but since the spleen is the organ in the body which tries to filter out junk from our circulation that might do us harm, that may mean that uh, the body had in some way neutralized it. So basically, what are you, what are you going to tell people you, can't, you have no test to test their blood. It's not like HIV or non-A, non-B. You can't test their blood and tell them whether they've been infected or not. Uh, there's no way of forestalling what might happen if they were infected. No known way, still, of treating cryon disease. And so all you're doing is giving them a form of uncertainty which is worse than the form of uncertainty. That's, that was my view. And I knew that some patients felt this, that there was no point knowing this sort of information, that it could only possibly prove to be um, a source of long-term anxiety and blight, in a way. So um, we decided that 
as well as uh, explaining, as usual, you know, as we because we don't have a test, but with a test you're supposed to uh, explain the individual implications of having a test with a view to them. Uh, deciding not to have the test under certain circumstances. Here, we thought it was the information itself that the patient should decide they want to hear about or not. And in fact, after talking to our patients uh, who, the, who this letter would have gone to, uh, they divided, as far as I remember, fairly equally between people who had a very pronounced desire to know and people who had an equally pronounced desire not to think about it ever again. So. And there was no public health uh, implication to this in that, um, you know, so basically for all those reasons, we decided to offer them the option. And as I said, I don't think we were the only centre to do this. And, and the, way you put, that. the way you put it in your statement, Dr. Bevan, is that you and your colleagues concluded individuals should be given the right to know or not to know the right not to be passive recipients of the information. Yes. And um, we can take the letter down. Thank you, Shumit. Um, next one to ask you about a letter you wrote to... I mean, I would say Sorry. that I never had any feedback from patients suggesting that they were offended by the letter or, or confused by it or otherwise wish they hadn't had it. Most people seemed to appreciate that we were giving them a, a degree of empowerment, however slight. Next, going to ask you about a letter that you wrote to a newspaper. I think it was the Independent. Um, you've discussed it in some detail in your statement, but I just want to ask you about a couple of parts of it. So it's UHMB 606 underscore 064, please, Shamik. It's a letter written in April 1991, or published, I think, in April 1991. Um, um, and you say this, I'll, I'll just read it so that, again, those following can um, follow the evidence. The worst conceivable response to the HIV tragedy in British haemophiliacs is to throw this group of patients to the mercy of the market, not only for provision of their health care, but also for the supply of factor rate on which their health and lives depend. That is what's happening, however, as part of the reform of the National Health Service. Presumably, the government feels that its obligations to the British haemophilia community have been paid off by the settlement of the recent legal action, but must be aware that a cost-cutting war among haemophilia treaters and factor eight manufacturers will reduce the safety of the blood supply, as illustrated by your article of the 9th of April. They should also be aware that the legalistic defences which saw them through will not work a second time since they can never again claim to be surprised by the contamination of crude preparations of bulk plasma by unknown viruses or other infectious agents. The haemophilia treaters who bear the ethical and medico-legal burden of providing the safest possible products for their patients will find themselves constrained by a ruthless requirement to cut costs. In case haemophilia treaters feel disinclined to favour these products on the open market, a scandalous linkage has been arranged between the proportion of BPL products bought and the price that the hospital concerned will be charged for totally different blood products such as red cells and platelets. This smart move in effect places patients with leukemia and other serious blood disorders in the position of hostages in a sordid commercial battle for factor VIII orders. Such destruction of the ethos of the gift relationship in blood and plasma donation previously exemplified to the highest degree by the blood transfusion service and its, BP, uh, its blood products laboratory at Elstree surely illustrates the dark side of these in invidious reforms. Um, Dr. Bevan, I wanted to ask you two questions. One, one is specifically about the, the linkage you refer to in the penultimate paragraph. But before we do get to that, what was it broadly that, that um, triggered your writing to, to the paper in these terms? Uh, what a firebrand, eh? So how nice it was to be young. Um, <laughs> I think uh, the, the main... Uh, lesson of this letter is probably to take care before writing to, to, to newspapers. And I must admit, when I saw it published in the Independent, my heart dropped through my boots. Um, they had edited it substantially, but I can't even remember what they edited out of it. Um, 
I don't think they changed the sense of it. So what may have provoked this was anything from a manager giving me a hard time at St George's about the amount I was spending on factor eight and telling me that uh, you know it had to stop or I had to stop treating patients. But the the the, init the thing that uh, the center of it is, I mean BPL was finding its way as a commercial organization or a pseudo commercial organization in the face of the um, the government reforms, you know the. Uh, the government reforms of the NHS, which obviously from that you can tell I'm no, no supporter of, uh, and the, the intensification of budget pressure on, on treaters. And of course, as haemophilia treaters, we were always way outside in terms of product cost per patient, um, and therefore an easy target, particularly since you know we were accused of spending as much on treating 20 patients as the trust as the hospital spent on the entire pediatric ward and things like that which was actually the way it was not just at the Royal Free but also at George's I was getting similar stuff from the managers newly empowered by the reforms one of those reforms meant that BPL had to try and find a, a commercial footing so no longer were they allowed to going to be allowed to provide free product based on plasma donations as in the past but they had to charge for it and they were struggling with exactly how to do this while while fulfilling their mission to to supply patients with the blood products they needed and uh one of their mechanisms that they proposed and which i was directly attacking this letter was to say well the um we'll make the price of platelet transfusion platelet concentrates you know, to your hospital dependent on the amount of factor eight you order for us so the more factor eight you order from us or buy from us under the new arrangements the cheaper will be your platelets and um, if you don't buy so much BPL from us the cost of your platelets will go up and I must admit I found this linkage this is what I call the scandalous linkage um, it particularly hit me because I was responsible both for treating haemophiliacs with factor eight and for treating people with leukemia and other conditions with um, with platelets and so it sort of directly hit me that I was being sort of held to ransom over in fact I think they dropped that idea pretty quickly not I, I do not claim any any uh, agency in that for this letter but I think I wasn't the only person to object to this um, linkage of blood product costs to how much BPL product you bought the fact that I was actually keen to buy probably as much factor eight wires uh, possible for a long time that didn't play any role in this in fact in my in the in the paragraph where I allude to you know they can't be surprised by the contamination of crude preparations of bulk plasma I was at that time a uh, part of a, a group of haemophilia treaters who wanted to go to the so-called high purity factor eight on the basis that if you if you if you uh, construct a system which sp specifically extracts factor eight from plasma, you're likely to lead, leave unwanted things behind. And uh, I suppose you can say that my warning that there will be new agents with unpredicted characteristics which will invade the blood supply actually came what well, was manifested by the BCJD experience. So. Um, even though I'm embarrassed by this in retrospect, I'm no longer, I, I, I feel no actual huge difference from it. You know. And again, for the benefit of those listening who may not have read your statement, you, on that issue you talk about, about the adoption of high purity factor eight, you've said this in your statement, I strongly agreed with those UK clinicians who considered that the adoption of high purity factor eight was an important step in future-proofing factor eight safety since HIV showed that novel organisms with hitherto unpredicted effects could suddenly invade the blood supply. It was no good to simply protect against known pathogens. In future, they might not be enveloped viruses susceptible to heat or viruses at all. The official contention was that the HIV epidemic was an unforeseeable event due to a completely novel virus that couldn't be seen coming. My doubt about that excuse was that it simply would not do next time around. Uh, and so, no, I mean, yeah, that's right. I mean, whether the um, partial purification by affinity chromatography, which is what we were talking about, I mean, 
that was a variety of um, commercial new new versions of commercial factor eight. They were they were treated with heat appropriately and they were safe, but they were also uh, purified so that uh, things of unpredictable chemical nature w would would tend to be uh, ex avoided. Of course, a few years later, you know, one was able to do that simply by moving to recombinant products, achieve the same degree of theoretical safety. Whether the high purity product actually did eliminate any infections is is moot. You know, we never knew. The the, the next topic, Dr. Bevan, is is to ask you about your involvement in the HCV look back exercise. Um, and I wanted to ask you first about the national look back in the 90s. I think we sent you a couple of examples of, of um, blood transfusion service generated letters about individual patients from 1996. I'm not asking you about the details of, of individual patients, but okay. what, what can you recall from your perspective as, as consultant and haemophilia centre director of your involvement in the, in the national um, blood transfusion led hepatitis C look back in in the mid-90s? In the mid-90s, I think we complied with it as well as we could, given the information we had. And it was the result of our uh, look back that resulted in the identification of those of the two cases that uh, I was then written to by the blood transfusion uh, lead. Would I be prepared to counsel them? Which, of course, I was, because they were my patients. With, but they didn't have haemophilia. I mean, that, a slight irony. And, of course, that's what... The look back was intended to do not just pick up people with bleeding disorders, but everybody who would have been exposed. Um, so we, there, it helped having a relatively small group of of patients. Um, the, the the workload imposed on the department by the look back in the mid nineties, I think, was not. We we did it. I think I don't think we fell short of it. Um, the later look back. Anyway, sorry, you may not be asking me questions about the later. Well, I'll, I'll come but to that in a, a, in, in, in a moment. But um, um, ca can you recall uh, what the mechanics were or the process was that was asked of you um, at St George's in relation to the first look back, the, the, the 1990s look back? It was just a, to... to uh, Record every example of a person given a blood product within that time scale in the hospital, which is obviously a large one and largely descends on the blood transfusion department as, as organised. And uh, anyone who'd ever known my colleague, Dr. John Park Williams, would know that he was likely to be encyclopedic about that. So, as far as I remember, I just uh, repeatedly. Um, I, I just, not for the first time, provided the list of my patients who had, who had been exposed to um, C through their plasma, through their haemophilia treatment. And the rest was done by John Parker Williams and the blood bank, and I think quite effectively. And then if we move to 2011 and we look at HCDO 40510, please, Shomek. So these are the minutes of, a, of a, a meeting of the advisory committee and the annual general meeting of uh, UK CDO, October 2011, and you were in attendance. Uh, and if we just go to the bottom of page three, please, Shomek. We can see at the bottom of the page says HCV look back exercise. The aim is to identify all patients affected with hepatitis C and to calculate the burden of disease for planning. There were 15,057 patients registered during the period of risk, most with mild bleeding disorders, 11,567 are still alive, number of forms received is 3,266, etc. Um, and then it says in the next paragraph, it's generally agreed that the burden being placed on centres is too great, and then there's a decision about what to do in relation to forms and the collection of data. Um, what, if anything, can you recall about this look-back exercise in 2011? I must admit, I found this look back exercise uh, somewhat amorphous uh, because, as it, as it says there, um, 
many patients have been treated because we were a, a reference centre, referral centre, call it what you will, comprehensive care centre. Now responsible for a large network, we were constantly we were referred patients for shared care or um, many more so, and that they would been from other centres in the in the area, so Lewisham uh, and others. And it, there was uncertainty about whether, you know, double reporting, patients deceased. Um, in addition, of course, at, at St. Thomas's, I no longer had any contact with the direct uh, involvement with the blood transfusion uh, system at, at uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's. So I didn't have any access to those. But have, thankfully, I did have a colleague, much regretted, uh, Dr. Thompson, who um, was able to devote a fair amount of his time to collecting it. So I think we, we did contribute data. It was much more difficult to be sure that one was complete with the data to the second look back. Well, I'm having this. And, and can you recall um, uh, uh, roughly how many, if, if, if any, um, leading disorder patients um, who may have been infected with hepatitis C were identified at St Thomas's as a result of uh, guys in St Thomas's as a result of this uh, this particular look back exercise. What who had never been recognised before? Mm. Oh, it must have been in single figures, but I can't. I, okay. I, I'm afraid I can't remember. Listen, I don't have access to any records of it. Um, I want to ask you next on a different topic, but looking at a, uh, also at a set of UK HCDO minutes from 1989. So could we have HCDO 5015 underscore 035, please, Shemek? So this is a meeting of Haemophilia Centre directors in October 1989. And again, we can see that you're in attendance. Uh, and then if we go, please, to page 5, Shemek. Halfway down the page under the heading litigation, there begins a, a fairly lengthy discussion about litigation. Sorry, I should have drawn your attention to the list of attendees. Dr. Regman from the Department of Health and a representative of the firm of solicitors, Cole and Cole, were also in attendance. Um, and we can see here there's a report from Dr. Jones. In the second paragraph, it says Dr. Jones highlighted the damage being done to the doctor-patient relationship as the case dragged on. And then we have... Uh, uh, Mrs. Simpson, partner in the firm of Cole and Cole, giving an outline of the progress of the defence to the patient statement of claim. Um, and then if we go over the page, we can see she provides um, various details about, about who's involved, about the progress of the litigation. If we could look at the bottom half of the page, Shamik, a little closer. Um, there's, you'll see that long paragraph there talks about uh, a questionnaire being produced and um, uh, who, who the lawyers were involved. And then it, that, that long paragraph ends this. Haemophilia Centre directors were not defendants and the lawyers would like the directors to cooperate fully and give as much help as possible. Um, and then in the next paragraph, there's a question about individual directors and the solicitor emphasised that the health authorities were the defendants and, and not the directors. And then if we go over the page, please. And we zoom in on the first half, including that long paragraph in the middle of the page, please, show Mick. We can, we can see uh, uh, Dr. Chisholm asks about the cost to patients and if directors could do anything to help patients. Mrs. Simpson talks about the defence lawyers looking to strike out the claim. Um, and then there's a long paragraph where Dr. Regman, representing the Department of Health, gives the government's perspective, no case for an out-of-court settlement, compensation must be sought through the courts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, it, it would appear from this discussion that directors were, to some extent at least, being asked to assist in the defence of the litigation. They were certainly being given a fairly detailed account of the defendants, including the government's response. Can you recall whether at the time that struck you as, as odd or concerning that, that directors were being drawn into the litigation for the defendants in this way? 
Um, okay. I kind of remember it because of Dr. Regman. Uh, somewhat. I could say he presented the government's position in a kind of hardline way that struck me as unsuitable, inappropriate. Um, that's about the only thing I can rem remember at that. Now, your, your question, sorry, can I ask you to clarify? You're asking, was I surprised that doctors were, what, talking well, about helping the plaintiffs? Or no, the, the defendants. defendants. Or being, being, as the doctors were not themselves individually being sued. Did anything strike you at the time, or does it strike you now as concerning about the fact that the directors were, as it were, almost being assumed to be somehow on the defendant's side or there to assist the defendants in their defence of the litigation? Uh, I mean, apart from the fact that, of course, the defendants are all paid... Um, employees of the National Health Service um, I would have thought yes that was a somewhat uh, unwarranted assumption that uh, I, I don't know quite how I can reply to that I don't remember any strong feeling myself about things just that this was the way things happened with um one was pretty aware, I think, that uh, uh, cases of um, medical negligence were unlikely to be straightforward against uh, doctors involved, and unless people could be shown, for example, to... Uh, as long as people were following the guidelines set down by the UKHCDO for the aforesaid Bolam situation. Now, I think... Obviously, I'm aware that BOLAM is now defunct and uh, different standards are applied. But I think when it, when it comes to legal action about treatment, it would be unusual if the, um, the doctors who, who ordered or prescribed that treatment did not feel somehow in, in, in the focus of the, the litigation. Um, and the assurance that so far no doctors were actually being individually sued would be regarded as not necessary in applying to the future. Uh, that's all I can say on that. I did not feel particularly threatened by anything, but I, I remember feeling uh, somewhat out of sympathy with Dr. Regiment's approach. Okay. Just, just one, one question about that, really uh, addressed uh, through you, uh, Ms. Richards. Um, if we go back to the previous page, uh, and thank you. Um, I think it's the previous page again. The page before that, shall Page we? before. Zero, 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 0005. Thank you. Uh, and it's the, what Mrs. Barbara Simpson was saying. Um, the underlying picture apparently being painted uh, was that the, the assembled doctors were assumed to have some interest which coincided with those of the defendants uh, in the litigation. Uh, and she appears to be asking uh, the doctors present to assist insofar as they could. Uh, I've always understood it as a, a general principle that when uh, asking people who are not themselves, at least currently, being sued for what is uh, expert opinion, that if it's offered, it, it should be available um, if... if um, the doctor or other person is invited to give a comment as opposed to make a report, it should be available to both parties so that both parties can see what the individual has to say uh, and the impartiality is not compromised. 
do you know whether, oh, whether uh, any inquiry has been made of Barbara Simpson uh, as to the basis of the request that she was making? I don't off the top of my head, sir. Um, we, I, we can certainly find out. Because it, it might, uh, might be a matter of, of importance. Well, it has to take into account that it, it's at a time perhaps before uh, Mr Justice Creswell set out in the Icarian Reefer the general principles of uh, how experts should behave, etc. But it was well known that if uh, individuals were suing doctors uh, who had been involved in their treatment, uh, that they ought to be freely available to go to other doctors uh, who would be under no sort of pressure one way or the other to say anything to uh, the uh, would-be plaintiff other than what they really thought, and the defendant similarly. Yes. Well, there I mean, we are. I that's don't, that, sorry, that, that's sorry. a comment by me, really, Doctor. It's um, just a rising out of this particular document, which we have seen before. I, I haven't asked that question before. I feel prompted to ask it uh, at the moment. Okay. Before we leave that, so Dr. Bevan, was there any further fair, comment you so, had? Sorry, is it fair to say then that I, um, apart from a general air of uh, concern, I didn't get any feeling that we were being directed um, not to uh, provide evidence for the plaintiffs? That, that's, that's, um, that's, uh, that's helpful to know at any rate. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, I mean, uh, that's I some subsequently reassurance. became much more acquainted with... Um, clinical negligence through my work as an expert witness in, in various cases. So even through the later knowledge I have, I, I wouldn't have seen any any uh, direction there that one was not to provide information to the plaintiffs or their representatives. Sorry. No, no. Um, so that concludes the questions I had for Dr. Bevan, but I had a handful of questions from CPs over core participants over lunch. And obviously, we should afford them the opportunity to suggest any further questions um, uh, arising out of Dr. Bevan's evidence today. So I was wondering if we could take a break now for perhaps 30 minutes, um, and that will give the legal representatives of core participants the opportunity to email to, to me and to Mr. Bucher any further questions that they would like us to consider asking Dr. Bevan. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Um, you may have seen, if you've watched any of the previous uh, proceedings, um, Dr. Bevan, that at this stage um, we take a break so that uh, Ms. Richards can uh, field a any of the questions which others may wish uh, you to be asked, uh, and uh, as appropriate we'll, we'll ask uh, questions uh, when we return. Uh, so uh, we'll take a break now until quarter to four. Quarter to four. Excellent. 